To this point, in Chem 1211 and 1212, we've talked mostly about three broad areas of chemistry. The first is the area of molecular structure, and in particular, how we can describe and predict structure and what it tells us about the properties of elements and compounds, mostly physical properties we've focused on so far, like melting point, boiling point, dipole moments, vapor pressures, and the like. We've also talked about thermodynamics of chemical reactions, the energy changes associated with reactions, the laws of thermodynamics and how those apply to chemical reactions, and how we can harness energy changes due to chemical reactions. And within the area of thermodynamics is the entire domain of equilibrium. We can connect equilibrium to thermodynamics because there's a relationship between the equilibrium constant and the free energy change for chemical reactions. The third major area is kinetics. We've learned how to describe the speed of chemical reactions, and most relevant to the molecular level, kinetics tells us something about reaction mechanisms. That is, how reactions occur at the molecular level. These three areas are hugely important to chemistry, but particularly kinetics and thermodynamics require that we're given a chemical reaction. In other words, we're given the reactants and products of a chemical process. At this point, we're going to move into a hugely important question, which is how to predict products of a chemical reaction. Answering this question is really important because it allows us to look at a set of reactants and predict whether a reaction will achieve our desired outcome or not. To some extent, this is a thermodynamic question. We've talked a little bit, for example, about how chemical reactions have to be consistent with the laws of thermodynamics. We've addressed that already. What we haven't really addressed so far is the connection between molecular structure and reactivity. And we're going to make this much more clear in discussions of main group chemistry in this chapter. To begin addressing this question of how to predict the products of chemical reactions, we want to know what principles drive chemical reactions, and specifically we want to know the structural principles that drive chemical reactions. We've talked a lot about the thermodynamic principles involved, the first law, the second law, etc. But what structural principles drive reactions? Why does a particular molecular structure react in the way it does? There are three general principles I want to talk about here, and they're all kind of deeply related to one another on a fundamental level. The most essential of the three is simple electrostatic attraction. If you think about what a chemical reaction is, a chemical reaction involves the reorganization of electrons, and electrons are negatively charged. So if, for example, we have two species that have different charges, then to some degree the neutralization of the two charges, that is the attraction of these two charges to one another, could result in the reorganization of electrons. That is chemical reactivity. So electrostatic attraction on a very deep level drives a lot of chemical reactions. The other two principles that follow are really sophisticated riffs on this idea of electrostatic attraction. The second principle is the Lewis acid-base interaction, which we've experienced before in the chapter on acids and bases. Our typical paradigm for a Lewis acid-base interaction is a Lewis acidic species that accepts a pair of electrons and a Lewis basic species that donates the pair of electrons through a mechanism like this. But one thing to appreciate here is that this donation process is driven by the partial or even the full charges on the Lewis acid and the Lewis base. Electrons are negative, so the Lewis base will often have a partial negative charge owing to its excess of electrons, while the Lewis acid, which accepts the electron pair, is often partially positive. So to some extent, even the Lewis acid base interaction is driven by electrostatic effects. The final principle, which is new, that I'll write in black, involves the interaction between the LUMO, lowest unoccupied molecular orbital in a species, and the HOMO, the highest occupied molecular orbital in another species. This is really just a molecular orbital spin on the Lewis acid base interaction idea. A Lewis acid contains a low energy unoccupied molecular orbital that can accept electrons. A Lewis base, which donates electrons, contains an occupied molecular orbital that's high in energy from which those electrons are easily donated. So the HOMO-LUMO paradigm here involves two molecular orbitals in two different species at two different en energies with two different occupancies.
So the HOMO is a high-energy occupied molecular orbital, I'm drawing it in blue here, containing a pair of electrons. And if we think about the HOMO on an orbital energy diagram, it's going to be relatively high up. The LUMO is a low-energy unoccupied orbital, and we can think of, for example, a Lewis acid base process as involving the donation of a pair of electrons from a high-energy occupied MO to a low-energy unoccupied MO. The resulting molecular orbitals in the product are split in such a way that the electrons, which originally came from the Lewis base, are stabilized overall. It's this stabilization that drives the reaction. And since we can look at the shapes of the HOMO and LUMO to identify the reactive atoms, this allows us to predict products. We'll look at an example of this in a little bit when we talk about the HOMO-LUMO interaction in more detail. First, let's quickly revisit our definitions of Lewis acids and Lewis bases, which are really at the heart of many inorganic chemical reactions and organic chemical reactions as well. In the chapter on acids and bases, recall that we defined a Lewis acid as a species that accepts electrons. Since electrons are negatively charged, Lewis acids tend to be associated with either partial positive charge or full positive charge. We defined a Lewis base as a species that donates electrons. Lewis bases tend to be associated with a partial or a full negative charge, and this electrostatic attraction between the negative charge in the Lewis base and the positive charge in the Lewis acid tends to be a big driver of Lewis acid base processes. So in the typical Lewis acid base paradigm, we have a Lewis acid, which is partially positive, accepting an electron pair from a Lewis base. That electron pair is usually an unshared pair, though it doesn't necessarily have to be. It can be pi electrons in a double or triple bond as well. In this paradigm, you should notice that identifying the partial charges on the atoms involved is key. Doing that requires us to consider the distribution of electrons within each molecule. And this can get fairly subtle because many neutral molecules can act as Lewis acids or Lewis bases, and so we can't always use formal charges to identify Lewis acidic and Lewis basic species, although those often help. We need to think about more subtle structural factors that dictate these partial charge distributions in neutral molecules. And, and that sounds fancy, but really it's worth keeping in mind that there's a deep relationship between electron density and electronegativity. So we can use the atoms involved in a molecule to think about the distribution of charge within the molecule. To give you an example, consider a molecule like CH3Br. Let's consider a reaction between this molecule and something like hydroxide, which is pretty clearly a Lewis base with a negative charge on the oxygen atom. That formal charge points us directly to the oxygen as the donor atom here. And in fact, if you looked at the charges on the oxygen and hydrogen atoms here, you would see that the oxygen has a substantial negative charge that is much, much more negative than any charge on the hydrogen atom. So that's clearly our Lewis base. But the question of the Lewis acid in CH3Br is an interesting one. Where is the partial positive charge within this molecule? Well, if we consider electronegativity, it's fairly easy to see that the most electronegative atom here is bromine. Recognizing that, we can identify that this carbon-bromine bond is going to be polarized toward bromine. And I'm just using this wedge to show that there's more electron density on the bromine atom because of its high electronegativity. This means that the bromine atom is going to be partially negative, leaving the attached carbon partially positive. And this is our key point of reactivity. This is the Lewis acidic atom within CH3Br. So this just showcases the kind of thinking we need to do to go from structure to reactivity. It really comes down to identifying electron density and these partial charges within the Lewis acid and Lewis base. And keep in mind this general relationship between electron density and electronegativity. In general, more electronegative atoms have larger electron density, and they tend to be associated with partial negative charges to the expense of less electronegative attached atoms, which tend to be associated with partial positive charges. We can see the relationship between electronegativity and electron density in homo-lumo interactions as well. So just to introduce this concept, let's look at the reaction between ammonia, NH3, and BH3, borane. 
ammonia with its lone pair that's relatively high in energy is a great electron donor. It's a great Lewis base. Lewis bases tend to seek out species that are partially or fully positively charged. And for this reason, and since the nucleus is positively charged, we often call Lewis bases nucleophiles. You'll see this term, for example, in organic and inorganic contexts. The borane, on the other hand, accepts the electrons and is itself partially positively charged. It's the Lewis acid, and we refer to Lewis acids very commonly as electrophiles since they are looking for electrons. They're looking for negatively charged electrons to neutralize their partial or full positive charges. From a homo-lumo perspective, the homo of ammonia is relatively high in energy. There are two electrons within this orbital. That's how we know it's the highest occupied molecular orbital. We see two electrons within it. While the lumo of the borane is much higher in energy. I actually misdrew this on an earlier slide. The LUMO is always going to be higher in energy than the HOMO because unoccupied orbitals tend to be higher in energy than occupied orbitals. Only the most reactive, uh, for example, negatively charged species are going to have HOMOs that are higher in energy than the LUMOs they're reacting with. In any event, these two are close enough in, in energy that they interact strongly in the same way two atomic orbitals would interact to form a molecular orbital Molecular orbitals in two different molecules can overlap to form new molecular orbitals in the resulting products. And as we saw previously, that interaction produces a product, it's drawn down here, in which the electrons that were formerly part of the lone pair in ammonia have been stabilized as part of a new sigma bond in the product. A new antibonding orbital is also formed that's higher in energy but this is unoccupied, so this doesn't have an impact on the stability of electrons within the product. Finally, I want to draw your attention to the shapes of the HOMO and LUMO, which are actually critical in identifying the atoms that are going to engage in reactivity in these processes. It may seem natural that since nitrogen and boron are the only non-hydrogen atoms within these two molecules, that they're going to interact with each other. However, in other cases, it's not as straightforward to identify, for example, the most nucleophilic, the most Lewis basic atom within a molecule. The HOMO makes clear that the nitrogen is the most Lewis basic atom within this structure because it's got large lobes on the nitrogen atom. It looks a lot like a nitrogen 2p orbital, in fact. Those large lobes associated with the nitrogen atom indicate to us that the nitrogen has the most electron density. Makes sense, right? It's the most electronegative atom. And so it's going to serve as the electron donor or the Lewis base. On the other hand, if we look at the electrophile, the largest lobe in the LUMO, and indeed the only lobes in the LUMO of this compound, show up on the boron atom. These show us that the boron atom is the electrophilic atom that will accept the electrons. These lobes in the LUMO, I think of them like landing pads for electrons. As the electrons come from the ammonia, they're looking for the large lobes in the LUMO to be donated to. And depending on where those lobes are located, which atoms those lobes are associated with, we should expect reactivity at those positions. I want to look at one more quick example of this with actual molecular orbital calculations to show you how this works. Let's consider the reaction of cyanide, Cn-, minus, which has a Lewis structure that looks like this, with acetone, which is a somewhat larger molecule, the important pieces of which I'll draw out explicitly, and I'll just fold the rest into shorthand. So it's got two CH3 groups and a central carbon-oxygen bond, and this is really the key point of reactivity in the acetone molecule, this carbon-oxygen double bond. Cyanide is a negatively charged molecule, so we can identify this pretty clearly as the Lewis base. It's going to be the electron donor because of its negative charge. But the question of which atom donates electrons is something of an open question. The carbon is formally negative, but both atoms bear lone pairs that could in theory be donated to a Lewis acid. To decide which atom will actually be donated, we can take a look at the highest occupied molecular orbital. And this is just the results of a WebMO calculation on cyanide. In this case, the highest occupied molecular orbital is the one with highest energy containing two electrons. So the occupancy is two, that means it has two electrons within it, and it has the highest energy of these five occupied molecular orbitals. If we pull up this molecular orbital, we can see that the largest lobe in the HOMO 
is indeed located on the carbon atom. So that's consistent with the formal negative charge, which is good. It means we can use that formal negative charge to identify the most Lewis basic atom. However, it's important to recognize that we had a choice and that the HOMO points us directly through its largest lobe to the atom that's most likely to donate electrons. Beyond just identifying cyanide as the Lewis base, we can identify specifically the carbon atom within cyanide as the atom that's actually going to donate the electrons in this process. Given that we've identified cyanide as the Lewis base, we can identify acetone as the Lewis acid in this process and take a look at its lowest unoccupied molecular orbital. So again, I have a WebMO calculation for acetone here, and we can identify the lowest unoccupied molecular orbital as the lowest energy orbital with zero electrons within it. So it's got an occupancy of zero, and it is the lowest energy orbital in this series of unoccupied orbitals. If I display molecular orbital 13 here, what we can see is that the largest lobe within this LUMO is located at the carbon atom. This large blue lobe within the LUMO points us to the carbon atom as the major point of reactivity in this molecule. So not only can we identify acetone as the Lewis acid, but we can take this to a deeper level of detail and identify the carbon as the specific atom that will accept the electrons. And now that we've identified these two atoms, it's simply a matter of pushing electrons from the Lewis base to the Lewis acid to identify how the reaction occurs. There's a little bit of extra electron pushing that goes into this in much the same way we have an extra shift of electrons in a Bronsted acid-base process. But in any event, the specific details of that you'll get much more familiar with in organic chemistry. The point I want to make is that this process of examining the orbital shapes of the HOMO and LUMO has allowed us to identify the product of a Lewis acid-Lewis base reaction.